to have Professor Lindy Elkin Stanton, a planetary scientist from the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Professor Elkin Stanton, tell us, how can we make a difference in education so that we can shape a so the society's future? And how do we learn what we want to learn? The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Is everybody ready for this? I was just saying thank you, Farah, and thank you so much for inviting me to this program and how great it is that, that SFIS has this program because uh, changing graduate school is one of the things that we have to do. Uh, so um, I'm not going to answer that question straight off if you don't mind, um, but I'll go right into my talk if that's all right. Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> Are you going to stand there for the whole talk? Oh, I want me to... Oh, I was just thinking, <laughs> you might be more comfortable sitting down, I don't know, because okay. it is going to be a little while. Okay, uh, but you're welcome to stand there if you want. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'm, the title of the talk here, Why Do We Go to School? Leadership, Thinking, and Problem Solving. Um, I'm going to start by telling a story, and it's a story, my personal story, and it, and it maybe will help to answer or give context for some of these questions that, that Farah was, was posing. Um, and I want to say right up front that, uh, that, that I'm, going to, I'm going to propose that some of the things that we're trying to do together in education and leadership are radical. Um, but I want to make it really clear to you right at the beginning that I know that I would guess every single person in this room also has a radical vision for what they're working on and what their education can be and the way that they're teaching. And so um, I want to make it really clear at the, right, at the beginning that I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to an audience that is uninformed in this area. And, and so I, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand at different points and answer some questions, because I think there's a lot going on out here, too. So the, the story for me, I want to start um, with the fact that I'm a planetary scientist. And, uh, and, and famously, or this happens to me all the time in interviews, people say, well, what was your formative moment? Like, when did you know you wanted to be a planetary scientist? It must be like when you were 10 and you looked through a telescope and you saw Saturn, and that was your moment. Because, I mean, we all know people like that. They looked through the telescope, they saw Saturn, that was it. They were going to be an astronaut, they are going to be a planetary scientist. Well, I did look through the telescope, and I saw Saturn, and I still wanted to be a veterinarian. And so. <laughs> And so I don't really have that kind of origin story. And for a long time, I felt like I was kind of wandering idly. And so um, it turns out I wasn't. But I wonder how many of you did not have a straight through career and either have been or feel like right now you're making really curvy choices. Is anybody making curvy choices? Excellent. OK. We are all of the same family here. Right. So, uh, so I went to MIT as an undergraduate, which was actually an, an amazing experience. Also, because when I came, arrived as a freshman in 1983, and there were only 20% women undergraduates, and it was um, both a wonderful experience and also an eye-opening experience, I think. And uh, but at the end of that experience, and I can't explain to you why, because I don't know to this day, I had so little confidence in myself that I would not go to a conference and stand in front of the poster of my master's thesis which today is my second most highly cited paper. So it was not a piece of crap. And I would not stand in front of it because I was really scared. I just did not have the personal uh, confidence. And I, I can't even really embody that person anymore. I don't even know who she was. But that was the truth. And I went to work for um, what was then called uh, Touche Ross and is now called Deloitte. I was a management consultant uh, in Philadelphia for a year. And I had this mind-blowing experience, which I also wonder if any of you have had, where I left um, a very rigorous, very quantitative science program and went to work in management, where it turned out that if I could make something up in my head and convince the people around me that it was real, it became real, like magic. And you know, you can't do that in science, actually. It doesn't work. Uh, but it turns out in human organizations, it works. Did anybody else have that revelation, by the way? That was such a revelation for me. Some of you did, yeah. I was like, what world is this where I could just make it up and then it becomes true? And so I, I did that. I worked in magazines for a little bit. I ran a company um, uh, writing business plans for high-tech companies. I learned what, how to write a pro forma. I knew what a budget was. I learned some things about management and organizations. Um, and I uh, then taught math for two years at, uh, at St. Mary's College of Maryland, where I met James Tanton, my husband, who's right here. <laughs> um, he was actually, this is not a secret story, but we don't tell it to just anybody. Um, he was actually assigned to check out my teaching and find out if I was a good enough lecturer, and that's how we met. <laughs> so I joke that I got an A plus and a date for coffee. <laughs> um, and so then I realized that I wanted to go back to graduate school. We're having a problem. 
Can you stay for the podium until we get it switched Oh, out? my goodness. Okay. All right. Back row's having a hard time. All right. How's that? Ooh, now a little feedback. How's that? Is that good? I can't walk around anymore. All right. Okay. Um, so at that point, I'd worked in business, I'd done these consulting things, and I decided that none of the jobs I'd had so far uh, had the, the infinite challenge that I was looking for. I decided I wanted to go back to academia where you could always ask a bigger question. I decided to go back to grad school. And so um, that's what I did when I was 31. I went back to get my PhD. And, um, and, and as I always say, I, was, uh, I started my PhD the same week that my son started kindergarten. And I was a single parent at that time. James and I had been dating. But he was still living in Maryland. And I was living in Massachusetts. And we were just kind of making it work. And, and I tell this story because I've had so many people respond to it with, I've had a story like that and I never knew that you could end up kind of doing whatever you wanted. I thought that I had more or less limited myself by changing my mind 15 times and working in different disciplines and you know, single mother, back to grad school 10 years too late, all those things. It turns out none of that matters. It turns out that if you keep working, it's all fine. And so, and so here's, um, that's part of why I'm telling the story, but here's the next part of the story. So James and I get married and I finish my PhD and I'm working in academic science. I'm doing research 100%. And um, Turner, our son, uh, you know, he's around 10, say, and we start having these conversations uh, among the three of us about what is a virtuous career? What is actually the best way, the most, the way with the greatest impact, I do not believe the word impactful is a word, the way, the, the way you can spend your time that has the greatest positive impact in the world. And, and I imagine that some of you have also been thinking about this and um, over time, and I would really love to hear your thoughts. And so we talked about this literally for years on and off. Um, uh, and, and so you know, a typical answer might be, well, give charitably to food banks or um, figure out how to um, uh, support the homeless or you know they're, they're you know be mother teresa there's lots of ways that are sort of automatically you think of as being the thing that's good for the world and um and of course what what we decided was that education was the answer <laughs> we decided that 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 the thing that the world needs and this is our vision to the day to this day is 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 a, a critical mass of people who feel that they are problem solvers and they have the agency to solve problems i, I we feel like if if there was a world of these people, then things would get done. Problems would be solved. People would be making better decisions, for example, when voting. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm totally agnostic about what that decision might be. But to train people how to know what they know and to care about that, and also to recognize that most problems are unsolved and that everyone can take steps toward them. And so, and so we were like, yes, we nailed it. It's education. We've got to teach people to be problem solvers. You know, and then we spent about three years going, so how would you do that? How would you do that? And of course, we're reading stuff, and we're talking to people, and I'm at universities, and James is teaching, and, and Turner's uh, you know, in high school at this point, and, and then Turner's in college, and then Turner's graduated college. And, uh, and then there was one day when we were, we were sitting around having breakfast. We were eating Eggs Benedict at Elmer's store in Western Massachusetts, if you've ever been there, in Ashfield, Massachusetts. And, um, and it suddenly occurred to us that what we wanted to figure out was we wanted to figure out a way to teach people how to learn um, in the way that you would learn if you were not in school. Is this working? Yes. OK. Thank you, team in the back on the back table. That's our interplanetary initiative team back there. Um, uh, we wanted to teach people how to learn in the way that you would learn if you were not at school. So, so if you have a question today, probably what you would do is you would go to your computer and you would Google uh, your question. And then you would get this ocean of content. And, um, and you know, in our cynical way, we'd probably say, like, most of it is useless, and most of it is wrong, and most of it we don't trust. Some of that is just an emotional reaction to its source and may not be true. Um, but what one generally does is then you digest a piece of content. You read something, you watch a video, something like that. And and then you have what we call a natural next question that will take you one step closer to your goal. And so what we've spent um, a lot of time doing since then is, is developing this methodology and a platform and then working with many people, many people in this room um, and outside of this room about how to bring this into the classroom. Uh, and then, and then um, then in, in 2016, we founded a company called Beagle Learning to build the platform that allows you to do this online remotely anywhere in the world because it's our contention that we don't have time in the world today 
for incremental or boutique solutions, that we need to move faster, everyone's got to be all hands on deck to solve the challenges that are facing humanity now. And so in our opinion, it's not worth doing if it's not scalable. So that was absolutely critical to us. It had to be scalable. And that all is one of the reasons that I'm here at ASU. It came five years ago, uh, because this is a yes university, where the bigger and more audacious your idea is, the more likely it's going to get support. And my experience of other universities is most of them are no universities. And so so, um, so that's all part of it. So in 2016, we founded Beagle Learning to make the platform. And then in 2017, uh, our proposal that we've been working on for six years was selected by NASA for flight. And suddenly I was the PI of the NASA Psyche mission. And, um, and so this is a robotic mission to, to what we believe is a mostly metal asteroid. It'll be the first mainly metal object that humankind ever visits, sending a robotic orbiter out there. We have been working on the proposal since 2011 and we'll launch in 2022, we're in what's called phase C. We're starting fabrication right now. And it's a big, big project. Um, the, uh, the, the PI managed uh, cost is $853 million. And so I take it really seriously. There's a lot of taxpayer dollars out there for this. And right now our team is about 800 people. Um, and, so, and so I've been thinking even more about teams. And, and looking back, Looking back at that curvy path that I just described to you, I realized that there was method in my madness. There was a reason I was choosing each of those directions in retrospect, and it was the search for a team where people wanted everyone to succeed. It was the search for a collegial environment that was not any longer the traditional hero model of academia. So for millennia, academia has been organized as a series of heroes on mountaintops who control their pyramid of people and ideas, and they fight off all attackers, like city-states. And, and I think we have a lot less of that here at ASU, and I would guess that probably nobody in this room operates this way. But I would also guess that everyone in this room knows people who operate like that. And, uh, and it's not uh, a conducive atmosphere if you are not feeling super confident. It's not conducive if you are in the minority in any metric. You don't, if you don't feel fully supported, you're likely to be bullied out. So there's a lot of problems with the model, as well as some benefits. But for me, I was looking for a place where people could work across disciplines, where every discipline was valued, where every person was um, supported. And, and in an ensemble sense, the success of the company was uh, more important than the individual shining of, of, of an individual person. And so this is a, especially a model that, that Evgenia Skolnik and I have worked on together in Interplanetary Initiative. That's how we put together our team. Those ideas going around in my head a lot of these education ideas, and it, and it kind of went like, it kind of went like this. Um, so uh, we're just funded to, to send a rocket into space to go look at this asteroid. And, and we start out with a team of four people. And we end up with a team of 800 people going through a proposal process that is beyond belief. And, um, and, and the whole thing is like this. You have to have the engineer and the scientist, and of course they can duke it about, out about who's the cooler and more important person, like as one would in the sort of traditional academia. But you also have to have the schedule and the person who runs the budget, and you need the artist, and you need the marketer, and you need all of these people in the room appreciating each other and supporting each other and respecting each other, or you're not going to succeed. And so I'm thinking about that model. And I'm thinking about how in the classroom, we basically don't do that. Uh, you know, those skills are not what's taught in the classroom. The classroom is still um, a, a, the microcosm of the traditional research university. The classroom is still compete for scores, complete to, compete to be the, you know, the biggest genius, compete to be the best regurgitator of the lecture, not how do you value everybody's input, input, um, input and how do you hear every voice and how do you make something bigger than just yourself? And so we started really trying to work, especially um, Evgenia and I and the whole team of people working in interplanetary initiative and then all of our friends who were also working using kind of exploration learning techniques, which is many of you here, on ways that we could change the classroom model to be this kind of model because it, it became more and more clear in our minds that, that the skills you need for life are not the skills we're teaching in school. The skills you need for life are these kind of collaborative, appreciative, respectful, professional kinds of skills where you can make something bigger than the individual. So that's what we've been setting off to do. Uh, and so this is a great, I think, a quote by Jonas Salk that I really, really appreciate. The object is not to put the, other, the down the other, but to raise up the other. And, um, 
uh, there are plenty of places in hardcore research academia where the whole point is to put down the other. Uh, I was, uh, there, was a, there was a scientific talk um, at, at a place in Washington, D.C., and, and my friend's high school age daughter came, came to hear the talk. And afterwards, she went home and she said to my friend, well, so it was a really interesting talk. I learned all this science. And at the end, there was this time when people stood up in the audience and they asked questions, but they weren't really questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I know that time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a New Yorker cartoon about that, too. Like, we now end the regular lecture period and we and we begin the five minute lecture period <laughs> um, and so so how do you get out of um, the model of competition uh, as the only way to create excellence how do you get a model where cooperation is the model for excellence so that's what we're trying to do so interplanetary initiative um, and the things we're trying to do in education Content, I would argue, here's sort of the fundamental idea of, of the kind of education we're doing. I don't think content is any longer the arbiter of education. Content is ubiquitous. So we can't claim to be the only people who teach X or have X content, because it's really available everywhere all the time. And so, and so we need to get away from uh, uh, this, this sort of tyranny of content, is what we've been calling it. Um, most of the content that we teach uh, is not going to be used in the workforce. And in fact, most careers are new. Um, by far, the majority of our students' first jobs as they leave the undergraduate experience are going to be jobs that don't exist today. So how could we possibly teach them? And I would also say that, that all, of our, all of our fields in academia have, have what I call the sacred content. And, and I wonder if this is true. In fact, I'll ask you in a moment to raise your hand if it's true for you. It's certainly true for me. So I studied uh, um, planetary geology. I studied petrology. I studied geophysics. And each of my faculty would teach a course in their specialty that was the content that was passed to them by their advisor and by their advisor's advisor and their advisor's advisor, you know, updated with new references, but the sacred content. And you can't really be a geophysicist unless you know A through G of the sacred content. Do you all, can you imagine, is there a sacred content in your field? Does that ring a bell for people? Yeah, a little bit. And have you, some of you rebelled against the sacred content? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, Dave Gustin is the original rebeller against the sacred content. I love it. This is why he and I get along so well, among other things. Uh, and so the sacred contents. And so, and so we want people who can arrive at the job ready to learn and innovate. Uh, and that is not how people are taught right now. Uh, so we think we should teach learning and problem solving explicitly instead of hoping it gets acquired along the way. Um, uh, you know, normally schools will say, absolutely, we teach critical thinking. But then, but then if you're really, really mean and you sit down with the individual instructors and you say, what is critical thinking and how exactly do you teach it? Normally, people don't actually know. You know, they think, well, we read the, something and then we talk about it. And so that's the kind of a critical thinking. But, but, but we think actually this should be really explicit. We think process should be first and content should follow. Uh, and in a sense, that's how we learn when we're trying to learn our own things. Um, and so then there's this wonderful quote, um, which uh, is Evgenia's quote, um, which I always attribute to Evgenia. I should put your name on there, actually, instead of just saying it out loud. Um, learn to abandon to deliver with and motivated to solve unsolved problems. And so how do you how do you succeed academically as we all have done perforce and that's why we're in this room. How do you succeed academically up through high school and often all the way through undergraduate, it's by being the ultimate passive listener. If you, if you can listen to the lecture and absolutely take it in, if you're one of that single digit percentage of people for whom lecturing is a successful learning technique, then you're golden. You are the person who can take it in and put it back on the test and win that test score. And that is your personal um, imprimatur of academic excellence. And, and uh, the problem is that then when you go into the workforce, or if you go into graduate school, not only is that, are those not the skills you need, they've actually trained you completely wrong for what you need to do in real life. You know, in real life, which I include graduate school in real life, in case you're wondering, <laughs> Um, what you have to be able to do is recognize that almost everything is unsolved, that almost no questions are answered in the back of the book, and that you yourself have to be the arbiter of whether your work is correct and enough. And those are none of the things that you learn in traditional classrooms. And so our, our idea here is that, is that we can teach that not just in undergraduate, but all the way through from kindergarten. Uh, that's what we think. And uh, yes, and Michael Oliver here is doing it for K through 
K through six. Uh, and so we just met today, but he's been doing this constructivist kind of concept for over a decade. How long? 18 years. 18 years, almost two decades, K through six. And so we're doing it here in, in undergraduate, and so now we need to span the, the works. All right, uh, so the, the skill, the metacognition, the process uh, uh, needed for independent learning, for life, for work, it has to be needed. The skill that we're teaching has to be needed for life and work or we shouldn't do it. We should not be training students to be better test takers or lecture listeners or sitters still. And so, and so what we're thinking about all the time as we're designing these courses is, are the assessments that we're putting in and are the practices and the exercises and the techniques that we're using, what is needed for work and life? And if it's not, we shouldn't be doing it. So that's kind of our arbitration. Um, Here's a little graph that, that comes from Beagle Learning. Oh, you can see just the tail end of the beagle over there. I cut off the front of the beagle. That's his tail. <laughs> see in the lower right. Um, so higher education trains content knowledge, but not these 21st century skills. We're now calling them transferable skills rather than 21st century, because I think they're the kind of skills that take you anywhere you need to go. They're the kind of skills that grad students learn if you didn't learn them before by running a program. Um, and so content institutions teach it, graduates are assessed by it, employers hire for it, check, 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 all the way down. But critical thinking, teamwork, and problem solving, in general, institutions don't teach it. In general, graduates are not assessed by it. And then employers need it, and they don't get it. Uh, you know, there's that kind of insulting phrase, uh, you're hired for your, so for your hard skills and fired for your soft skills. And, and, and although I hate calling them soft skills because there's nothing simple or secondary about it, uh, the truth is that is what determines whether you succeed or not. Uh, you know, are you clear in your thinking? Can you recognize what's an unsolved problem? Do you know how to take steps towards solving it? Can you play well in groups? Do you know how to give and receive feedback? Those are the things that have you succeed later in life. And, and, I, and I hypothesize, I don't know if it's true, but I hypothesize that the reason that so many of us have an existential crisis in graduate school is because all the ways we've been judged excellent up to that point in our lives are now useless and we're suddenly cast adrift to figure out all these other things by ourselves, unless we have great mentors, um, the way SFIS is trying to set up for this program. I wonder, does that seem true to you, and for any of you? Does that seem like the existential crisis that you went through? Some people say yes. I see other people who are withholding judgment. <laughs> so I, I, that's a hypothesis. All right, so two challenges prevent change, challenges among others, but my favorite two. Um, the time necessary to retrain teachers to change curriculum is prohibitive, and there are no standard assessments for these skills. Those are two big problems for bringing this in the entire range of education. And so we're trying to solve some of those things. So let me walk you through um, what we consider our inquiry cycle. Um, and Evgenia and I have just uh, 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 finished class a half an hour ago, um, a class that um, we've now been teaching, um, she and I and a couple of other instructors uh, over the last four years uh, testing this over and over again. And how many of you are in that class or took that class? There's some people back here who did, at least two people. Okay, cool. Um, so you can, you can like uh, ask them secret questions about it when I'm not around later. Uh, so, so here's the idea, trying to model again the way you learn when you're learning on your own, trying to teach people methodically how to take these steps to be confident enough to take these steps. So the first thing you do is set your big goal. And so the goal we have for our class this semester is um, uh, how do we, I can't remember exactly how it goes, how do we, how do we um, maintain a healthy human biosystem in space and all the parts that pertain to that, the microbiome, radiation damage, microgravity, how do you create the architecture that can allow you to do that? Well, how do we learn about human physiology to make these tests? So the, the best kind of questions, and to my mind, the most common kind of human questions are super interdisciplinary. So right away, already in this class so far this semester, we've read about microbes, you know, we've read about radiation, we've read about human physiology, we've begun to read about space architecture. There's so many different things that come in. And, and so that's the big goal. And then uh, the first thing you do on the very first day and every week or, or twice a week thereafter is um, have a piece of content. So that piece of content on the first day might just be a little lecture to kind of get us going. In our case, it was a discussion, uh, a discussion about what this topic might hold for us. And then, um, and then we ask a question. And so and this is one of our one of our, our our fundamental concepts, the concept of the natural next question. So we've got a big goal out there. You know, who knows what your goal is? Your goal could be something very different. Your goal could be why, to understand why girls can't go to school in my town. Your you know, your goal could be um, how do we clean up our river? 
There are lots of different kinds of goals that you could have. Um, after you set your goal, you read your first thing, and then ask the question, not the question about the content you just read. That's what we've been taught to ask questions about our whole careers, the Bloom's taxonomy of questions about what you just read or learned or watched or heard from somebody. Instead, it's a question that takes you one step closer to your goal. So almost like a little research question, a mini research question scaled to the amount of time you have to try to answer your next question. And then if you repeat it over and over again, you end up with a kind of a mind map. And so, uh, you know, maybe you take that lower path and you have some content, you ask a question, you have some content, you ask a question, and then it turns out that just isn't leading the right direction. So you go back and you start over at a different node and you keep going. And you build up this mind map. So why would we do it as a mind map? Well, metacognitively, uh, if you can put your learning into a graphical structure that connects it together, you will remember it better than if it's just individual facts. So this is almost the opposite of cram for the test. This is put it into a structure that connects to other things you already know so that you can then remember it more effectively. And um, we're, I mean, we're doing different pieces of research. We've done actually and begun to publish some uh, cognitive science research about these things. We don't have any research yet on um, whether people are able to uh, retain this knowledge better. But we have a lot of anecdotal information about this, um, and which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, and so this doesn't actually project very, very well. But if you can take my word for it, let's see. OK, can you see the red dot? People in the back can see the red dot. Yes, Josh can see the red dot. Thank you. All right, so we're going to start up here with define a goal. We talked about that. Then you enter this thing we call the inquiry cycle. So do some research. Get a little content. Maybe somebody gives you a lecture. You watch a video. You go on YouTube, whatever it is. And then you can summarize or communicate your research. We do this in groups in the classroom. And then ask your natural next question. Then do a little research and go around and around like that. And then periodically, distill all the things that you've learned and bring it out to the world. So the inquiry cycle used in the classroom will teach iterative and collaborative problem solving. And this is literally exactly what we do in the class all semester. What we did today was the distill step. Every week up until now, we've done an inquiry step. And here's the amazing thing, the thing that I wasn't sure was going to work, and I think none of us who were working this way knew. It turns out that even um, first semester freshmen are absolutely willing to learn what a peer-reviewed journal article is, to find them on their own, to read them and try to understand them to the best of their knowledge and to stand up in class and say what they learned. And uh, it's so powerful when everyone in the classroom is trying to solve the problem and no one in the classroom knows the answer. And so, and so along with this tenant I said earlier where if it's not a skill you need for life or the workplace, we shouldn't be doing it, and, and another tenant would be don't lie in the classroom, and by which I mean I know there's kind of an odd, like, duh, but let me tell you what I mean, because I'm, I'm sort of being a little facetious about this. But, but very commonly, I would stand up as the lecturer, and I would lecture, and then I would give you all some problems, and uh, you wouldn't really know how to solve them. And I would know how to solve them, but I wouldn't tell you, because I need you to figure it out. Uh, what about, what if it's a scenario where none of us knows the answer, or whoever knows the answer shares it with everyone else, like you would in the real world when you really cared about getting an answer moving forward? And so that's one of the beautiful things about this. As soon as you're all in the same side, all trying to solve the problem together, then everyone is brave enough to contribute. And so we've done this five or six times. And um, how many other institutions, six other institutions, are using uh, techniques like this and finding a lot of success? So in our class today, we have, I think, four first semester freshmen. And we have five or six PhD students. And then everyone else is in between. And every single week, everyone finds and reads their own peer-reviewed journal article, then comes to class and reports out on what they learned. And then together, we decide what the natural next question is for the next week. And the thing that blew my mind when, when Evgeny and I taught one class where it was only undergraduates, and everyone had their own separate goal, making their own separate mind map. And the undergraduates would stand up in class, or they'd sit in class, and they would eagerly tell their classmates everything they learned from reading this peer review paper without ever looking at their notes, because they had internalized it, because it was their question that they were answering. And by the end of the semester, they could stand up and give an entire talk about everything they learned without ever looking at their notes. So that's a level of retention I never experienced myself in a lecture class. So I feel hopeful about this as a way to teach content along with process. 
So um, this is a, a really, really bleached out picture of a map that we actually made about uh, the goal of the class was um, what processes would be different on an Earth without life. And so we built up these paths, um, and there are actually paths in here you just can't see, with questions and content, questions and content. And after one semester, that would be just like a third or a quarter of the whole thing. And each of those content cards would contain the papers that we read and the summaries that we made and the questions that we asked. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the natural next question. Uh, this is, um, you know, as I was saying, kind of our favorite concept, the fundamental concept. I kind of think it's a little bit magic. I actually think that learning how to ask the correct natural next question is not just a skill you need to do research, but it's also the skill you need to lead a meeting or lead a team or be the person who clarifies what we're all talking about and gives us a direction to go in. And so, um, and so I think there's maybe some power to this. And so we started asking ourselves, is there a way that we could actually measure how good someone's natural next question is? And so we made up this thing called the Question Productivity Index, because of course it has to be an acronym. This is really ironic to me that I have these two acronyms, NNQ and QPI, because working with NASA all the time, it is such an ocean of acronyms. We actually keep an acronym list for the team because we can't keep track of our own acronyms. It's hundreds of acronyms long, and I have to look them up all the time. And I always tell people, no acronyms in papers. You have to write it out, because an acronym stops your mind. And yet here I am with acronyms. OK, so we have two of them, the natural next question and the question productivity index. And so we, we um, Start again with the goal, right? This is, this is a graphical way of looking at this. And some content. And then you're going to ask your natural next question. So what are the things that would determine whether or not this was a productive question? Well, we thought about it a lot. And we now have a collection of, of well over 1,000 natural next questions that students have asked in all different disciplines. You know, This might seem like it's kind of ready made for science, because I'm using it in science, but um, it's being used in Spanish and business and uh, a, a, a different disciplines. I can't even name them all. It's a little bit discipline agnostic. It's more challenging in math. That's an interesting question. How do you teach math using the inquiry cycle? Um, easier at some levels than others. Haven't quite figured out how to do that at the upper level undergraduate uh, level yet. It's interesting. So what are some things that matter? Well, we, we, we decided there are three metrics, scale, relevance, and articulation. And so uh, scale is just really more or less the size of your step. If this was a vector, for those of you who like vectors, it would be the length of the vector. That would be its scale. And so, and so the question you have to ask yourself is, how much time do I have to answer this N and Q? If it's something, in our, in our case, we want it to be about the right size that we could find a peer-reviewed journal article that is more or less on this topic that would help us learn most of the answer to the question. This is another thing that students don't get enough practice in, reading things where not every single sentence is on the test, so to speak. Because really, when you go out and read something, it's maybe the second half of the fourth paragraph that's the answer you're looking for, and the rest of it's irrelevant. And we've had undergraduates say to us, we've never had that before, where we have to really dig through and find the bit that helps us answer our question. That's a great life skill, and one that it had literally never occurred to me to teach before. And I'm sure some of you are ahead of me on that one. But that was one of many little revelations that we've had. So scale is, is how big a step it is. Then there's relevance. And we measure that by thinking kind of schematically, how closely does it point right toward your goal? It could be super interesting. It could be exactly what you want to learn next in your life. But maybe it's not actually directly answering your goal. So that's relevance. And the last one, articulation. Oops, sorry. Very distracting. Um, Articulation is, uh, we, we, we describe it as, would everyone in the group understand this question to mean the same thing? Uh, and it's amazing how hard it is to learn those skills. And so um, we've had um, experts from many different areas. Everyone in this room would count as an expert, by the way. Uh, 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 grade or score natural next questions that real people asked using this metric. And we found that there is a high level of agreement on the question productivity index, um, even among people, who, between people who are from quite different disciplines, disciplines different from the one the question is in. Though it turns out even if you don't really understand the exact definition of the noun that's in the question, you still know whether or not it's a good question just from your training. And so we created this thing called the Question Productivity Index Rubric. And so um, just to walk you through this, so at the top there's relevance, how relevant the question is to the larger learning goal. Scale, is it one reasonable step in size from your current knowledge? 
an articulation? Is it well posed? Use good grammar? Would everybody understand it the same way? And so for relevance, we have uh, down at zero. This question is not actually a question. <laughs> this does happen, of course. Um, it's amazing in these classes how quickly people improve their grammar, by the way. It's a great thing to learn. And then all the way up to five, you can immediately see how an answer to this question would attend to the issues or goal of the topic. Then for scale, there's kind of a Goldilocks scale. It's appropriately sized, or it could be way too big, or maybe you could just Google it and get the answer. And so there's a lot of uh, differences in scale. And then articulation, the question has too many subjective terms. It has grammatical errors. It has misuse of terms. It's not really answerable. All the way up to the question is clear, well posed, and contains no subjective terms or bad grammar. And so um, we've been using these this QPI um, we're in the process of training a neural net with the many, many scores that we got so that we can get automated QPI analyses for questions that students ask every day of their undergraduate career and hopefully see their improvement over time. And, uh, and actually, the company right now is um, working with uh, ETS, Educational Testing Service, to um, potentially, we think this is going to happen in the spring, we don't know for sure, line up a bunch of QPI uh, use in classes with their critical thinking test heighten uh, in the beginning and the end and see whether we can correlate improvements in critical thinking with improvements in QPI. So this is an interesting bit of research. We'll see how that goes. Um, Evgenia and I have used it in class just as this rubric, this piece of paper, and we've asked students to score their own questions and then ask their colleagues um, for help in improving their questions. And that's actually ended up to be a very popular exercise. People care about their questions. They care about what they are trying to personally learn. So um, the next thing that we're doing is we're proposing a, a Bachelor of Science uh, here. And I want to, I wanna, before I really walk through this slide, I know it's distracting to have words up behind me and it's bad form, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, I want to I just say that uh, the inquiry cycle I've been describing and the kind of methodology I've been describing is, is one way to bring problem solving and inquiry into the classroom. And there are so many different ways to do that. And, uh, and, and I recognize and honor these many, many different ways. And Evgenia is running, she's the lead of our working group on, on exploration learning, which is a term we've been using here at ASU for different ways you can bring these techniques into the classroom. And so we have periodic meetings and workshops where everyone is invited to come talk about what they're doing and share techniques and go back and forth. And um, that's been really, really helpful, I think, and interesting. And we have baby steps and we have giant steps. And so you can do anything in between. Uh, but then we thought, uh, in fact, we were encouraged by our fearless leader, Michael Crow, to come up with um, a, a degree. And so, and so we did. And, so we, um, and some of you may have been on the reviews and kind of know about this. Uh, we're calling this degree Technological Leadership. It's a Bachelor of Science. It can be completed in three years. It's designed to be completed in three years. And so it would be ASU's first three-year undergraduate degree. And it's being, uh, it's coming out of Interplanetary Initiative, which is a pan-university initiative looking at the future of humans in space and seeing if we can involve every discipline and make society better along the way. And uh, this is co-chaired by Michael Crow and myself, and it is not an academic unit. And so, and so this degree is coming not from an academic unit. It's coming from our PAN program. Uh, and it's going to be held at the college, because we need somebody who's got the infrastructure. Um, Many of you in this room are participants and even instructors for this, which is lovely and fabulous and super excited about that. And uh, so we've been through several of the levels of approval. We got approval from the college. We have approval from the Board of Regents. We got approval from CAPSI, the committee. And the last, um, the last review will be October 2nd with the full faculty senate. And we have our fingers crossed that uh, the senate will like it too. And if, and if it does and the approval comes through, then we will launch um, in August of 20. 2020, both in person and online. Uh, and, um, and so before I even go through the description of the slide, I just want to say we're very eager to work with everyone who's interested in this. This doesn't belong to just one unit. This belongs to all of us. We have, I think, 15 different units participating in the majors. What's the right, is that the right number, Josh? Yeah, I think it's 15. Um, Josh is our, is our academic success specialist who's, um, who's helping with all things and uh, will advise the students should we be so fortunate to have some. 
<laughs> so, uh, so the idea of this major is specifically to teach problem solving and create a group of people who are collaborative problem solvers um, who, uh, with a sense of agency. So the process comes first and the content comes second. So there are paths through this major where you do mostly design and paths where you do mostly aerospace. We want to have a whole bunch of different paths. Everyone's going to learn some math. Everyone's going to learn to code. Everyone's going to learn to write. And everyone's going to learn to problem solve. And that's really what it is. So every single semester, every single student takes an inquiry course. And that's the kind of course I've been describing, doing this inquiry cycle, learning to do the research, and eventually in their third year, creating new knowledge from the basis. Today we had, actually from Kevin, who's sitting right there, we had an, a natural next question that turns out is a very rich research question that I don't think anybody's actually done. And we've actually had already a paper published out of an N and Q. And so uh, I don't think that's a bridge too far. And so these are classes you can take over and over again, just like you would do research continuously in your PhD. You can do it continuously in your undergraduate. And then every semester, every student will take a making course, which is the same kind of thing, but outside of the classroom using your hands. And so some of them are um, aerospace engineering uh, making courses where you'll learn design and fab. Some of them are design courses. You'll be working with um, Jake Pinholster and using techniques from Haida. Um, we really are eager to make one with SFIS. And Dave and I have been talking about this um, extensively. I would also really love to have one in social action because that's another kind of making. Uh, let's go out and see how we make change in our communities. That's another kind of making. Uh, and then uh, two or three content courses. And then uh, every summer, there's an internship with a job. And, um, and that job, you'll be asked to learn some of these key transferable skills. And your, and your internship mentor will actually be helping to assess you on those things. And so that's, that's the uh, Bachelor of Science in Technological Leadership. Um, Thunderbird School has uh, proposed, I believe, to make a standalone master's based on this concept. We got a lot of support and interest and, and a lot from people here here today. Of course, it doesn't exist yet. Hopefully, it'll exist soon. It's nice to be excited about things that don't exist yet, but I hope it'll be as exciting once it does exist. And so my, my parting words might be these, um, uh, be bold and be kind. Uh, and, and that's the kind of world that I was looking for as I was wandering through my curvy path. And I really do feel like I found it here at ASU. And uh, I think that together we can do really great things. Thank you so much for listening to my story today. Thank you, Lindy, for this very illuminating talk on um, leadership, problem solving, complex problem solving, and education. Uh, we are going now with a questions and answers session. So we are a very big crowd today. So please, uh, if you want to make a question, make sure it's a question, not a sentence. Because <laughs> there's a lot of us. Uh, raise your hand, and my colleague uh, Salah will bring the microphone to you. So please, hands up if there are any. Also, mini lectures are good. <laughs> <laughs> then I think I would need to use this to speak, wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah, if you'd like, I can moderate the questions if, if that's good. Dave. Dave Preston, thanks for the call. Um, fabulous, as always, presentation. I'm curious, uh, and I'm sure you have thought about this, seemingly completely linear process of inquiry. <laughs> and yeah. I mean is there is there something to square there or is that you know yeah, um, so is that's, that an ideal of inquiry that simply doesn't correspond with the way we as larger beings need to make our way through the world. I'm curious what you see in inquiry that's linear. Yes. The vector pointing toward the goal and ah. the deviation from that. Oh, the QPI bit. OK, so all right, perfect. Yeah, all right. So so all of you who are mathematicians, imagine you have a super, super curvy path that gets you between here and there. But every step of the way, you might have one little tangential vector. <laughs> Those are your N and Qs. And so, so when, you look, when you look at the mind map, I mean, the truth is inquiry is very windy. Um, and there are dead ends. And one of the things about working in a team trying to solve a problem is that you very often 
go down a dead end, but then you forget where you've been before. So if you've made your mind map, you can back up and know what the history was and not do it again. So today in our distillation process, we asked every student to bring in an infographic of what they learned so far, something that fit on one page, learned so far in the semester. And Evgenia and I had, us, had the students go around and each one held up their infographic. And um, there were three kinds. Uh, some of these students, most of them had never made an infographic before, and we gave very minimal advice about how to do this, because that's also real world, isn't it? It's not so prescribed. So one of the kinds was kind of linear. People made, like, this is what we did the first week, the second week, the third week. Some of them wrote below that, here's what we summarized. And then here was the thought that was, um, what was the phrase that was like uh, promulgated by, like, yeah, there were next questions above and also the thought that all of that promoted in me um, from it. So that was very linear, kind of what you're describing. But then a larger group of people made a very complicated network, a web of the knowledge with connectors and arrows of all the ways that things connected. And then another group drew a schematic of the human body and then drew arrows to all the parts of the human body to talk about the kinds of health issues and the kinds of topics that we learned about how to pertain to individual humans. And so, and so I thought that was kind of great that you could see how nonlinear everybody was because to me at least that's much more true to the thought process, the real thought process of research and also the opposite of of, and if I would just sorry, take up one more second like over answering your question. <laughs> Thank you for your question. The way we as super experts in our fields think a topic should be taught, we've discovered is almost never the way a first time learner wishes to receive that topic. And so if you follow someone's actual natural next questions on a topic, even by the time you've studied that topic for three weeks, they don't seem like the right ones anymore, but they are naturally and correctly the right ones because that's really what the, the asker, what the learner wanted to learn. And so, and so it is nonlinear and it's not the way the expert thinks it is. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you Thanks. very much. Uh, I have a, two questions that are related. So the, the first is, what is the role of the teacher facilitator in this process? And then the second, which I think is related to that, is how does the scale? So how do we take yeah, yeah, yeah. large classes online? <laughs> All the things. All the things. Um, I, I guess I would say that the job of the instructor is, um, it is a facilitation job, and it's really a metacognitive job explaining the process, more or less like I just did, right, Evgenia? And then, and then just um, handling some class logistics. But I think every single time that we've done this, which is now six or seven times in person, the class itself has made decisions about what's happening. Um, like there was a point halfway through one of the classes where the students said, okay, we totally get this. We get the N and Q, we get how to find peer review papers, we get how to review them, but answering only one question a week is way too slow. We need to really speed this up. So we're gonna voluntarily divide into groups and choose our own N and Q. So that was that class. They were like, okay, do it. So now we kind of built that in. And so we've just split the class today into groups. And then each group has its own trained facilitator and process observer um, who will report back on how things are going. So we're trying all the time to um, arrange for the learners, of which we are also learners, learning all these things, reading the papers, learning new things, to um, to understand how to run their own process. And, and then just to answer briefly the scale question, uh, we just have been having big conversations, Evgenia and I, and then um, also Beagle and Josh, trying to figure out how we're going to do the inquiry online. Because uh, the whole purpose of this whole plan from the very beginning was that it was scalable. And, and we think that the easiest way to do it at scale is to have each learner build their own mind map, but then come together um, to, come to uh, share the knowledge that they're learning and choose their next natural next questions. Um, so that's our hypothesis. And we shall see what actually happens. Uh, you know, All of you who've taught brand new classes know that it's going to be an experiment. Um, but we think it's going to scale. We'll see. Uh, Eric Stribling, uh, IGD, PhD. Uh, I wanted to know if your system has been tested in any other cultures beyond the American Oh yeah, it's such a great question. Um, uh, so, uh, so first of all, to clarify, so Beagle Learning is its own company, um, and uh, we are allowed to use it for the major because it went through a um, 
uh, there was a public request for proposal for things that where you can do mind map content and, and collect questions and things like that, which of course I could not be a part of in any way because I'm conflicted. And there was only one company that we could find in the world that does this. And so, um, so we are using Beagle, but also other software. And so this technique and the Beagle platform has been used in China with a biomathematician. It's been used, is that it? China is it? I feel like there was another place it's been used. It's been used in high schools and in colleges, in community colleges, four-year colleges, undergraduate, graduate, all in the US. Canada, anybody in Canada? I'm looking okay. at James. And I've been doing a little bit of mathematics with folks in India. Oh yeah, okay, so a bit in India, in person, in person in China, and in person in Canada. Um, but I think that there are really, really important cultural differences to be taken into consideration. Um, just from the very beginning, how do you have the courage to ask a question? Most educational systems in the world don't encourage that. So it's a great question, great problem. Love to work with people on it, yeah. Okay, I'm uh, Mark Phillips. I'm uh, nothing to do with education. Member of the community. Fantastic. Uh, an ex-teacher and worked on the idea of bringing critical thinking to the classroom on the elementary level 40 years ago. Love it. You're one of those gave people up. who does know what critical thinking is. Yes, you gave up. Because you, as a teacher, you teach for tests. Uh. The achievement tests come in. You have to do that. You have to do those things. There's just no time yep. to integrate that. Yes, uh, yes. Within the business and uh, many years working as an employer and looking for people, uh, as I told my table mates, if someone tried to apply for a job, I'd want the person with experience versus the degree. Yeah. Because I want practical skills. Yeah. So as an employer now with someone being taught your program, yep. how do you quantify that? How do you express that on a resume yep. so an employer can say, hey, this might be the yep. person I want? Yep. Thank you. Those are fan These are exactly the problems we're trying to treat. And by the way, you should totally talk with Michael over here. He's doing it in, in elementary school. Um, I have this dream that does not yet exist of, of uh, in our undergraduate degree that we're proposing, students will be making a digital portfolio that they can share with employers. They can say, I wrote this code, I made this piece of art, I did this piece of organization, I led this team, um, and they can show the evidence of it. But I would love there to be kind of like a Lego resume where they can say, I happen to be really great at asking the right question and it's a measure of my critical thinking and I'm gonna pull that data set into my resume and show the graph of my improvement in my question asking over my three years. I'm, and then the next thing that we're doing that's gonna be a, a formative assessment instead of a summative assessment, I wanna not, not have any summative. How many of you in your work life sit down twice a semester to take a multiple choice test to show what you learned, right? Not very practical for the workplace. Would love to do the kinds of assessments that assess how you behave every Day, which is actually how we are uh, you know, treated or cared for or judged in the workplace and in graduate school, frankly. So the second one is, can you give and receive positive feedback that creates a better draft? So this is something we don't practice enough. Uh, so the student creates something, another student gives them feedback, and then the creator gives response to the feedback. And uh, we're, we're, we've got an SBIR grant to do this. We've been working on it for a year. We've um, got the beginning of um, a metric for this so that people can actually get scored every time they do this, not just on, um, on uh, the positivity of their feedback, that's important, but did their feedback create positive change in the draft? So can you receive feedback and improve your draft, and can you give feedback that creates a better draft? Yeah. Have you ever thought about creating some kind of uh, interview help for employers to ask the right questions of uh. the Interview help for employers to ask the right questions of the students. That would be, a, anybody want to start a company? I think that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I also hope that we'll get lots of partners who will like to have our students for interns so that then they'll know them personally. Oh. Yes. So how would how does your system promote, you know, that problem solving game flexibility would be valued, which would be practical to make sure that 
we're something that we think about a lot. And of course, it's imperfect. You know, everything we do, and we tell the students this every semester, this is an experiment. Please let us know how it's going. Let's keep trying to improve it. I, th I think um, Evgenia and I at least have had uh, good experiences in this inquiry class. With undergraduates, they tend to panic the first day. Uh, how do I know I've asked the right question? How do I know when I'm done? How do I know when I've actually you know, answered my question? If Jenny and I would go, well, probably you won't. You know? And how do I know if my question's the right question? It's probably not the right question. You'll always be changing it. And then their eyes are getting bigger and bigger, and they're like, how will you know whether I pass or fail? And, and you know, our answer is, we want to see you making progress. The whole point is, keep trying, keep moving forward. That's how success is judged. This idea of failure, I know everybody talks about it, and so I'll mention it too. I just think it's terrible. I don't think in real life there is failure except for giving up. Uh, and, so, and so you just have to keep moving forward. And that's what we're trying to show in this class, that, that knowledge is always imperfect, and what you have to be is a relentless trier. Um, so it's our first attempt at trying to do that kind of thing and, and love to hear people's ideas about how to get away from the pass-fail mentality. Thanks. <laughs> we've never had anybody fail. You know, we've had, um, I'd say every semester there's probably one person who comes and doesn't keep coming. Um, but I think, have we ever had anybody not I mean, at people engage, you know, they... Everyone gets a medal? It's not that kind of thing, you know. It's, 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 does the person ask a question every week? Do they go find a paper? Do they try to summarize it? Do they struggle with the material? Do they come to class and talk about it? Um, so, you know, in the end, we have to give a grade, kind of have to give a grade. We're in the system. Um, oh, I almost had somebody fail. Uh, somebody who had a giant freshman year crisis and just stopped doing the work. And then, uh, and then we did a giant makeup effort, and she did a tremendous amount of original research and, and caught up. Um, so I, I don't really believe in the everybody gets a medal model, but I lo what, what the model I believe in is everybody understands themselves how well they did. <laughs> That's, you know, I don't really care about the test score. I just want the person to know I learned this and I'm good at this, or I really didn't try very hard and that was kind of sad. Can we have one last question? Okay. My name is Brett Smith. I'm a student in the MSTP program. And my question is, in order to ask the right questions, the student needs to be curious and almost have an investigative mindset. Yeah. How can you cultivate and introduce a student to be almost like an investigator yeah. of the problem in order to ask the right questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I want to uh, start my answer with um, with a tiny dog training metaphor, which um, is going to make James laugh because I spent many, many years training Border Collies to be obedience dogs and also to be sheep dogs. And when a Border Collie is a sheep dog, it has to make up its own mind about a lot of things because it's things are happening too fast. It's too far away from you. And, and the only time that those experiences absolutely fail is when the dog doesn't try. And, and so I think it's the same with humans. Like you have to offer a behavior and then that behavior has to be honored. Um, and I know that we are getting especially self-selected students right now, people who want to try this kind of experimental thing. Uh, and so I don't know how broadly successful we're going to be, but I will say it's encouraging because so far we found that if people have any curiosity about the larger goal, which is why the only thing they know about the course before they come is the larger goal, unless they've taken these courses before and then they're doing it again on purpose. But a lot of people don't have any idea what we're doing with them until they come into the classroom. And there's something intoxicating about being able to make up your own mind about what your next question is. Um, so far, that and we've never had anybody not have a question, right? Everybody always has questions. It turns out as soon as you let people have that freedom, there it is. And so I don't know what percentage of students it would work for, um, but I'd like to imagine that it would put us all back to when we were three and we just learned how to ask questions and we have a billion of them. And then it kind of gets pounded out of you. And so what I would hope is that when it's offered, everyone becomes three-year-old again. I don't know though. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Yeah.